All right, I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting a uh, Special Assembly Committee on Housing and Homelessness to order. We are scheduled today from 11 a.m. to 12 noon, although expect us to go beyond that. I'll speak to that in a minute. Um, uh, let's go ahead and do introductions, starting with Mr. Solt. Uh, Randy Solt, District 6. Pete Peterson. Robin Dern. Christopher Constant. Felix Rivera. And then assembly members on the phone, I believe we have Ms. LaFrance. Here. Thank you. And then do we have any other assembly members on the phone? Okay. Um, then uh, that takes us to initial audience participation. We have two folks who signed up for initial audience participation, and then there will be time permitting final audience participation uh, at the end of our meeting. I always do my best to try to allow some time for that. So let's go ahead and move on to the two individuals, starting with Mr. Oliva. Uh, if you can come up uh, to a mic, please, I will set the timer on for three minutes. Good morning. I hope you all got my email this morning. Uh. Sorry, I don't think it's working. Maybe maybe try a different one. Testing. I stopped it. Okay. Can you restart it? I restarted it. <laughs> okay. Good morning. I hope you got my email. It got broke into this morning. It was hilarious, uh, but take a look at it. Uh, that's downtown in the middle of the morning. Uh, I'm Rana Leva. I appeared probably as an expert multiple times trying to get out of my property and get the money difference that the city did not make up by consummating the purchase of my property next to the Brother Francis shelter. The other thing is uh, I've invited through the Rogers Park Community Council president, uh, Meg and Felix, to come and take a tour to see the negative effects of a homeless shelter and having a business next to it, how it can ruin your life um, marriage, spiritually, religiously, but most importantly for the community, uh, economically. So uh, I watched uh, last night's meeting because <clears throat> my uh, destructive anger takes over in the chambers versus constructive anger where I can focus and deflect with my humor. And believe me, you guys make me laugh quite a bit and at your own expense. Uh, last night, uh, you came up with a pellet house or a pellet home. Uh, I followed this homeless uh, issue for years. I've toured the United States looking at other facilities, and the pellet house isn't going to work. Uh, I want to suggest to you, and I have in the past, what's called an upster. Uh, the failure at Centennial Park is you gave them tents, and it rained. It was terrible. But if you can see in these colored photographs, a professor at the University of Texas converted, I'll say the word once, dumpster and made it into an umster. And as you can see, it locks, it protects you from the weather. It's not mobile to take it back into the woods, which happens with the tents and the economies of scale to rent what is an eight or 10 yard dumpster and the city has them in surplus, they're easily disinfected, the lids are on them, and as you can see, it'll hold a cot, it'll hold a cooler, it'll hold the fire extinguisher, a storage unit, everything you need. So what you estimated buying 30, I think there were pellet houses, you could rent 100 dumpsters for one-tenth of the cost and keep them for upster. You go from sleeping in a cubbyhole to a tent under a tree into an upster into when housing becomes available because people are going to stay outside and not abide by the rules. Now, I've 
I disinfected painted one and you have an example. And I think this will be a quick, clean solution. Uh, Felix, I can't see a clock, so. No. Oh, you've got it. Well, yep. Okay. Um, thank so, you, Mr. Oliva. Your time would, is up. Um, I don't see any questions from it, members, um, but if you have any additional information, well, feel free I do, to Felix. email us. Oh, okay. Yeah. The memorandum of agreement uh, when you license a homeless facility, it carries no bite. And Thank you, Mr. Lee. I'm going to okay. ask you to email us any anything else uh, that you have. Well, will you answer my emails, Felix? Thank you, Mr. Lee. <laughs> All right. Next, we have Mr. Quigley. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple things. Um, primarily, the assembly work session on Mar March 31st laid out the clean slate process. And I wanted to encourage you to consider allowing for individual community members to participate at every step along the way. In particular, the, uh, the third step where there's going to be a representative from a community council in each assembly district um, there to develop the criteria. I would encourage you to please solicit feedback from individual members of the community so that we can be a part of this process. We know our neighborhood better than anybody does. And I would like us to be able to participate in that process. My second thing I want to talk about is I wanted to address uh, assembly members Constance comments last night at the assembly meeting um, regarding our neighborhood. Mr. Constant, it seemed like you seemed to characterize us as a bunch of wealthy NIMBYs when we were talking about the charter school in your neighborhood and the Arctic Rec Center. And I wanted to encourage you to consider the fact that a lot of the concerns that we have are much the same as you have in your neighborhood. And I appreciate the fact that you are standing up for your neighborhood. When we first began the process of engaging on this subject, we found out through the Nextdoor app that this was being considered as a location. I found out that my assembly members, one is the executive director of the coalition who would run the rec center, and the other was really excited about it. And our community council didn't seem real engaged in it. The only people who really stood up for us at that time was the mayor's office and the Midtown Community Council. And so I appreciate them at least letting people know the need to consider the neighborhood. And I've seen you, Mr. Constant, defend your neighborhood multiple times, saying to, for example, Merrill Field, that they need to consider the impacts to your neighborhood. And that's all we're asking for. We're not asking to be treated special. We want to be part of this process. So I'd encourage you as the assembly to allow us to be part of the process all the way throughout. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, as I stated before, we will have time permitting final audience participation. And uh, stop. So first, um, I do I do want to apologize. So recently, we shifted from using the assembly chambers to using room 155. Several folks had that suggestion. and. Um, it looks like we have an overflowing amount of folks here. So I apologize that we don't have the appropriate amount of seating in here. Um, so let's get started. Um, so last night, um, I was pretty serious about being as efficient with our time as possible today. We have an hour max, hour and a half, if we extend to go through the ideas that are on the table. Um, here is the process that I have developed for today. I'm going to walk through this as quickly as I can. We're going to go through each of the actionable sections one by one and get the basic information we need to make a go, no go shelf decision. Things like cost, lead time, regulatory burden as we understand it, context to make a wise decision, etc. Once we get that information and have a succinct discussion, I'm going to ask each member, whether you're a part of the committee or not, to provide your go, no go shelf preference. You can add qualifiers to your preference if you'd like. Go, but I need X. No, go, but Y, or shelf until Z. I'll capture all of these preferences and qualifiers, and based on what I see, I will ask for a formal recommendation, asterisk, assuming that we actually have quorum by the time we get there, because right now we do not. Quorum in this committee is four members, and right now we only have three members of this committee here. Um, Moving on, um, and so I'll ask for a formal recommendation, assuming we can do that, and at which point only the committee members will be able to vote. Just to be clear, if we go with a go recommendation today, it's nothing more than a recommendation. Go means we're gonna be moving forward with sending something to the full assembly to make the decision. 
in tandem with the go, no go shelf decision, I want to try to get a clear understanding of how quickly we can take the action. There may realistically be some things that we can fund on April 18th or April 25th. And there may be things that will take weeks, if not months, for before we can make a funding decision. I also want to get a sense of requests for information members have on any of these actions. Um, as much as I want us to move forward with action as quickly as possible, I think we also have a duty as elected representatives to vet and ensure these ideas are viable. Last, this work is going to be fast and furious. So in my mind, it needs to be a true collaboration between the assembly and the administration. So I want to figure out who from the administration is going to take the lead on each of these sections that we decide to go fo forward with, and who from the assembly wants to take the lead on each of these sections we decide to go forward with. I can't do this all on my own, folks. Because I know this has been an issue in the past and was raised even yesterday, this formation of work groups or whatever you want to call it is 100% about fact finding and bringing information back to the public sphere for discussion. No decisions or commitments will be made in any of this work outside of the public eye. Um, any questions on process before we get started? Okay, not seeing any. So the order that I have chosen for this discussion is based on the resolution. Some sections talked about expedited basis and my own preference. So we're gonna have section five first, which is the exploration of the old Alaska Native Charter School. Section six, which is outreach. Section two, non-congregate. Sections three and seven, tackling together alternative forms of shelter and sanctioned cap task force, and then last, the Section 8 Behavioral Health Task Force. Section 1 on the Sullivan Arena closure isn't really an idea, so we don't need to go over that again. And Sections 4 and 9 on workforce development and food services don't need to be discussed specifically, but should be incorporated as needed into the discussion on each of the other sections. So let's go ahead and start Section 5, Exploration of the Old Alaska Native Charter School. I'll turn it over to the administration. Through the chair to Mr. Rivera, um, we do have ongoing conversations uh, with the private donor there. Uh, after we presented this in February, we didn't really feel like we had um, the buy-in from the assembly to explore this. So the conversations are still ongoing. I wish I had more of an update for you, um, but I don't at this time. So I, uh, I sent you a series of questions. Um, are you unable to answer any of the questions that I sent you? Let me pull those questions up for you right now. So there were questions that I sent on April 5th at 11.22 a.m. Do you want me to just walk through the questions? Um, I see these right now. Okay. Uh, recent walkthroughs, I believe the last one was done by Mr. Trombley, and that was about five months ago. Um, I can send you some of the information that he had gathered on it. Um, what will the relationship of the private donor to the MOA be? Uh, they would just be a private lease, as we would privately lease any uh, facility within the municipality. Uh, um, uh, what is the benefit? What is the benefit, if any, for a private donor in this deal? I don't think there truly is a benefit. It was just a property that was offered to us um, in time of need. Uh, for timeline for purchase, they gave us a 30 to 45 day closing window um, if we get a green light. Um, why would this need to be a lease for three years? I think when the discussions that we had with the donor, um, as to why it would be three years is just for the cost burden of leasing the unit for the municipality. Uh, we had discussed somewhere in the range of hundred thousand dollars a month until, uh, the property, they got their return on investment. Um, I mean, we could shorten that time frame if we just wanted to up the lease cost or lengthen that time frame if we wanted to have a lower monthly lease cost. Um, how long would repairs take? This is something that's still ongoing um, and in conversations with them. And then would the private donor cover remodel expense? I believe so. They are trying to get it up to, once uh, they acquire their property, they would have to bring it up to building codes. Um, and that's all I have for you right now. Thanks. Um. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I guess 
one thing that's been unclear to me, if you could please help clarify. Um, so let's say theoretical, don't crucify me folks. Let's say we do three years lease. After those three years, what happens to the property? Is the MOA kicked out of the property? I think those are discussions through the chair to Mr. Rivera. Um, I think those are discussions that are also ongoing. I think the combo um, originally was just, we have a philanthropic group that, you know, wants to do well for our community, wants to help out with the homelessness problem. And I think um, in the long term, I don't think we would be kicked out of the property, so to speak. Um, so I, ju I just don't have a clear answer for you at this time. Thanks. Um... Okay, so then following my process, are there um, any requests, or I guess any other discussion before I go to requests for information that members might have? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Constant. Thanks. Um, as you heard me say last night, I have a lot of concerns when the default answer always is North Anchorage. And so um, my response negotiated position with previous administrations was our neighbors are welcoming. We will accept one facility in our district with one facility out of our district, which will always end up with more in the North Anchorage district than anywhere else. But we can't stomach being the place the only place and so when i hear um concerns proposals you know we have the aviator which may convert some into permanent we have the guest house we have plenty and and the the deal the arrangement has been successful we we set up the alex we set up other facilities outside of the district even the sockeye and um so i would ask that folks maintain a perspective that when we add one into this district, we also add one outside of this district. And then second, and briefly, I would say that whatever terms are negotiated on a lease, it should be a lease to own proposal so that if we do succeed in using that property, the property should, um, we should make those investment time revenue to the property owner. Thank, thank you, Mr. Constant. Any other discussion before we move on to requests for information? All right, um, so do members have any requests for information that they need uh, on this particular section? I've already sent my question, so. Here. Okay, then. Um, um, oh, Dan, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you. And it's more of perhaps a clarifying question. I keep hearing the term donor used in reference to the potential facility. And from what I hear, um, it would be a lease scenario. And um, to Mr. Constant's point about pursuing a lease to own, that makes sense. But could I just get clarification um, that it is actually not being donated but the municipality might expect a less than market value um, lease for the facility. Through the chair to Ms. LaFrance, yes, that is, uh, I would say that's correct. I will clarify my use of the term donor. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so then um, ne next part of this discussion is the go, no go sh uh, shelf. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, I'm gonna ask each of the members to, uh, oh, Mr. Voland, are you with us? I'm here, Mr. Chair. Wonderful, we have a quorum now, thank you. All right, um, so, uh, um, we're going to go around the table. Committee members and, and non-committee members can participate in, in this particular part of the discussion um, and give your preference on go, no-go, and shelving the idea. 
Um, so I will go ahead and and start. Um, uh, for, so for this particular one, I've said it multiple times. There's no surprise. I am skeptical of this idea. I need a lot more information on this idea. So my preference is to shelve this idea until we really get more details. And um, for me, I think a lot of the other sections here have more promise in terms of being actionable quickly than this particular one. So that is my preference and qualification. Shelve until we get more details and until we act on some of the other ones. So I'm going to ask everyone to give your preference. I think that's reasonable. M Mr. Chair, just for clarification. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Roland. Sorry about that. I, I just joined a couple minutes ago. Which document are we working off of? Um, sorry, which? So we're not really working off of any document other than the demobilization plan that was approved yesterday. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Um, so we're talking right now about Section 5, which is the exploration of the old Alaska Native Charter School. And um, just, to, I guess, a quick recap for you, Mr. Volin. So for each of these sections, we're just going to have a discussion or a presentation on the section to give us the information we need. Going to explore if there are any requests for information that members have, have a discussion around go, no go, shelving, talk about timeline for the ones that we do decide to go with, and then talk about leads from the administration and the assembly for any of these that we decide to go with. So right now we have two folks for shelving until we act on other items and get more information. Go ahead, Ms. Dern. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I, I feel like I don't have enough information and I feel like I, I don't even have enough information to ask informed questions. So I feel like I, I need more information about the process, the renovation, the terms of the lease, the extension of the lease after three years. So um, until then, I think it's a shelving for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll agree with uh, Ms. Dern. I, I just don't think we've quite developed this enough to, to uh, move forward with it at this point yet. Thank you. So similar, similar response, um, you know, what's the cost? What's the, the layout going to look like? Just a lot of questions around the facility itself. I don't like the word shelve. It's it's more like in process. We still have work to do before we can make a decision. Because shelve to me is kind of like, I'm going to put it on the shelf and not come back to it. Thanks. Um, and then I'll go to folks on the phone, starting with Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to see this proceed concurrently because I agree with the other members who have said um, it's not a, it's not ready for us to take any action on. But um, I would like to hear more information. And if this is something that members of the administration believe it's a viable opportunity, um, I certainly would welcome more information and um, a path forward. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Voland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I echo my colleagues from South Anchorage. Um, I, I do want to explore this idea and would be happy to receive more information on it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so just based off everything that I've heard, I appreciate folks not wanting to use the term shelve. I guess I will use that with qualifiers. So um, the Moving on to a recommendation from the committee, the motion that I will ask for as a formal recommendation for this committee is a request from the administration to get more information regarding usage of the old Alaska Native Charter School and for them to present to this committee. Um, but until such time that that happens, um, we will not be moving forward with this idea. Uh, so if that's an appropriate and acceptable uh, uh, recommendation from this committee, then I will ask for a motion. And any member of the committee can make such a motion. So I think right now I have uh, myself, Mr. Constance, Mr. Voland, and Mr. Solt who are here.
Yeah, go ahead, Ms. Dern. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I just got a text from uh, John Weddleton, and he asked if they could put the demobilization plan on the web page for those that are on the phone. Thanks, uh, Mr. Turner. Can we go ahead and add that? Thanks. All right. Um, I'll go ahead and make the motion. Um, and I want, oh, yeah, the motion I would make is that we um, temporarily table the conversation about the Alaska Native, the former Alaska Natives Charter School, recognizing it has great value and opportunity. If there's a second. Uh, can you restate the motion? You're breaking up there. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with the mics. I've got a magnetic field, maybe. Um, the motion is to temporarily table a consideration of the former Alaska Native Charter School recognizing the property has m merit. Second. Uh, please, members. Uh, oh, well, is there any objection to the motion? I'm hearing no objection. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess I would just um, ask for the administration, um, is this enough information for you to move forward and get us what we're asking? Through the chair to Mr. Rivera, yes, sir, it is. Yeah. I just wanna say it openly, what I mean by it has merit is it's an amazing piece of property. The building may be defunct. The building may need to go in the consideration of creating an environment that is built for a population that could be served there. But the location is good, the land is good, it's it's an opportune place for some element within the context of a comprehensive system. So I just want to make sure that we're thinking of it not just as a band-aid but as an opportunity for substantial future development that just will take community input and um, real thought and investment. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and move on to section six, which is outreach. Turn it over to the coalition. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a presentation and I believe Mr. Turner is going to swap the screen out. So we want to talk about a summer street outreach strategy. Um, the idea here is um, we'll try to be quick. But first, uh, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Street outreach can be many things. So there are a lot of questions there. Um, so why are you doing street outreach? Um, because why you're doing it will um, indicate the methods in which you want to go forward. Um, and I'm just going to move th these rather quickly. I believe they're on um, the committee's website to get to the meat of it. Um, there are a spectrum of responses to assistance. And I think we need to be realistic. Some people will you know, after a number of contacts, after trust is built, or even on the first um, time, say, yes, yes, I want help. Some will never want help. And we just have to be ready for a spectrum of responses. I think it's really important as we face this summer's challenges to be very realistic moving forward. So what is impactful outreach? One, it's a professional intervention and it's structured, documented, and strategic to meet people where they are literally and circumstantially. It's also respectfully persistent. You have to be respectfully persistent to get that engagement, um, to, to show the people that you are showing up to help them um, move to housing, and then it's client-driven. So we talked a little bit about the difference between contact and housing-driven outreach. Um, one um, is what we've been doing with the grant we have from the municipality. We do pop-ups, we go to encampments, but we're really about uh, basic life safety needs, meeting um, people where they're at, gaining their trust, getting them into HMIS, into the database so that we know who they are, and then getting them on coordinated entry so that they are in uh, line for housing, so they are on that list. Um, housing driven outreach is where we have a housing opportunity and we are saying you match with this housing opportunity. How can we make that a reality for you? And we are persistent in doing that. Or if we don't have a housing opportunity, how can we ensure that you would be ready for a housing opportunity? Are you putting applications in? Do you have an ID? Are you document ready? Um, so it's both of those approaches. So we have a menu for you. 
because we figured we would bring all of the options and tell you what those look like. And um, we'll just kind of go through them. So the first one is scaling the contact-driven outreach. Right now, we see about 300 people um, that were unsheltered. That number is quickly swelling, and it's likely to swell closer to seven to 800 individuals. After the end of April, we'll be adding families to the mix, and we're already starting to add transition-aged youth. And so all of those are slightly different responses and slightly different um, needs. Um, so what we would leverage is the current um, alcohol tax outreach grant that we have. We're currently contracted um, with three outreach providers for five personnel. We could contract with additional personnel. We have a medical overlay with Solomedics, which has been terribly successful. Right now, we focus on getting folks into HMIS and coordinated entry assessments. We provide basic needs. We do pop-ups three times a week and encampment outreach by zip code. Um, we are understanding that the health department also has two outreach workers coming on board so we could hopefully all coordinate and leverage. Um, but right now, at our current funding, we would be overwhelmed and we wouldn't be able to meet the need. And one of those needs is food. Um, this summer, with the closure of the Sullivan Arena and other sites, there will really only be, I believe, downtown Hope Center will be the most accessible place to get a meal, but there won't be a lot of others. So we often bring food to outreach events, but if we are seeing lots more folks, we're going to need more resources, um, similarly for providing for those basic needs. Um, second is a, an attendant track which is addressing highly vulnerable needs. Um, there are a number of individuals with medical needs and chronic health conditions. Um, our best guess right now is 60 to 150. Um, if you were to go to the Sullivan Arena right now, you would see there are a number of individuals, a lot of walkers and wheelchairs, um, people who need um, dialysis regularly. And what we want to do is try to meet their needs where they're at if there is nowhere else for them to go. Right now, Complex Care has 47 people on its wait list. So there's nowhere quick. There's no quick resolution. So what we hope this would do is um, a leverage our current outreach pop-up, um, give us additional capacity with Solomedics, um, find options for the most vulnerable, whether that might be a single night or a limited hotel stay or more frequent visits to them to ensure their safety where they're at, working with partners to maybe identify cots to get people off the ground, the right type of hygiene and specific items to meet their medical needs, um, and transportation for medical appointments, um, whether that's, you know, through more bus passes or actually contracting with a transportation provider um, and really working with other community partners like community health workers and other medical services to get them um, to where the folks are that have these needs. So those are two options. The next two options are the housing focused outreach. This would add four to six housing navigators who are experienced that would be an experienced professional familiar with housing opportunities in Anchorage. We're not looking for entry-level folks. We need people who know how to navigate the housing opportunities, what landlords require. Um, and right now, most of our housing opportunities are coming through a combination of landlord housing partnership, the housing trust as those hotel conversions come online, and then other providers within um, the continuum of care, like when a permanent supportive housing opening is available. We do utilize the coordinated entry list, so it does build off that contact-based outreach. Everyone's on the housing list where they match. And we're already in the position of being what we consider like the housing referral air traffic controller. Housing referrals come in. We also hold the coordinated entry list. We get people matched up, and then we would deploy housing navigators to go find these folks to convert those housing opportunities into new homes for folks. Um, and when there wasn't a home available or a unit available, we can make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that we're conducting housing assessments, making sure folks are document ready, applications are getting in, all wait lists are you know, applied for. This also allows us to leverage two existing funding opportunities we have in-house. One is ARPA funding you provided us, which we use for single adults to help do that final conversion into housing if someone doesn't have a bed um, or needs moving services or needs a security deposit, we're using that ARPA funding so we can leverage that. We have similar fun funding for families through uh, Bezos grant. And so we would leverage that funding as well for uh, families that we were targeting. The last piece um, is no mobile navigation services. 
So we are really fortunate to have the Third Avenue Navigation and Resource Center online right now. And it's one location. And if we're going to have folks all over town, there's a couple of things about that. One, we don't want to overwhelm Third Avenue. Um, and two, not everyone's going to be able to get there if people are dispersed all over town. And so if we know where folks are, we want to really pop up twice monthly, basically mini Project Homeless Connects, if you remember that type of event, or a mini navigation center, longer hours, getting our partners there, um, pre-scheduled in advance with notice. So we're getting word out to the folks um, and possible contract or possible transportation for access, whether that's bus passes in advance or um, contracting for transportation services um, and really utilizing additional partners and services. Um, we'll have a shower trailer in June. What a great opportunity to leverage that um, throughout town, but particularly these. These will just take a lot of coordination and commitment because they have to, once you say you're going to do them, you've got to do them and do them well. Um, and this is also an opportunity for folks who might be seeking help, who aren't yet experiencing homelessness to engage in some pervert prevention and diversion opportunities. Um, we really would want these to be open events. We imagine them being outside, but every person we can divert or prevent from coming into the system is someone we don't need to find another home for. So, those are the options we have laid out. I have um, our outreach programs manager, Jason Cates, here with me if you have any questions kind of about how it's been going, um, because he is literally out there on the ground with folks. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Constant? Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, when discussing this population that is the 60 to 150 high vulnerable and sheltered individuals, with 47 on a potential wait list, are we talking about roughly 200 at the far end or are the 47 generally within the 150? That's a good question. I don't know what the current count at the Sullivan Arena is in the medical section of the facility, but everyone there would be someone I would consider highly vulnerable plus, um, and some of those may already be on the complex care wait list. That's why there's that that range. I I don't know. 150 feels okay to me as possibly the top end. I'm getting a head nod from Kathleen and one from Jason who are so, more involved with the yeah, folks. Great. Um, so in that context, how many units do we have at the Sockeye, the complex care facility? It's an 86, 86. bed facility and it's full. Right. And so has the funding model kind of settled out on that property, the way that we're providing housing units? Is, is it sustainable yet? So it's not housing, it's shelter. Okay, shelter. Um, it is a combination of funding, some of it with one time. Um, I believe that they are sustainably funded for the first three years of operation right now. The lengths of stay there are longer because many are on the um, – trajectory of getting a Medicaid waiver or PCA eligibility. And we're engaged with the state to see what we can do to expedite that, but it takes as long as it takes right now. So that is kind of driving to my thinking and what I think is a priority. And I'm not sure what the assembly can do to help facilitate getting the state on board with an expedited process for addressing qualification for these specific set of individuals, but I think we should put that on our table of things to do assertively, maybe with our lobbyists, maybe with an outreach campaign to the Department of Health or Department of whatever. And so that's one thing. And then again, I'm being long-winded, but um, the next part of the question is how many people do we have? Uh, I'll finish that by saying, I believe that those people, we should be able to come up with a method to support them as quick, very quickly. It's those are the low hanging fruit and we should prioritize them because they're the most in need and it's the most immoral for us to have people in walkers going up the highway on the streets. Now that the snow is melting, it's better. But anyhow, so how many people do you know we have in the HMIS that we're tracking individually? How many discrete? 3,000. So we have 3,000 people. I well, wonder. the 3,000 are people who are in the system. So some may be in transitional housing, some may be in emergency shelter, some may be in permanent supportive housing. Um, I guess, do you have a specific, are you I'm wanting to know how many people to, are in shelter right now? No, I'm trying to think like 
barriers and the eliminating barriers and transportation was one you specifically spoke about. And the idea of if we have an identified list that's a closed list or a, a not closed, but discrete list like HMS, maybe we can work with people mover to that bus pass system for people who are in HMIS. So it's not complete free rides for everybody, but it is for those who are screened in and maybe engaged in some form of action towards resolution that they actually have access to transportation. And so, or maybe it's a number of rides per month or I don't know. And so um, I'm just trying to think through how we start to sort through the barriers to get yeah. people in. And so I'll sum up by saying, I think we need to prioritize a focus on those highly vulnerable individuals. I did not suggest last night we keep the Sullivan open for another month, but if a proposal came forward that said we have a hundred people and we need to find a place for them because they're in wheelchairs and with walkers and they can't survive in the woods, I think that would be a priority we should focus on first. Um, so I just want to mention really quickly, we do hand out a number of bus passes and we do use our client services money to buy bus passes. That is actually quite effective for a lot of our folks. Um, and then while we talk about medical vulnerability. What we haven't talked about is behavioral health vulnerability. And we are looking at a significant number of individuals. I would say probably easy 40 to 50 coming out of the Sullivan arena who will be highly vulnerable due to behavioral health issues, particularly mental health issues when that closes. And I'll, I'll finish up. Is that in the one is that a separate group? That's a separate group because I don't have a specific strategy in mind quite yet. I think that's a very difficult situation. I mean, we, we just haven't come up with something. So I wonder if we could start to generate a, hate to, maybe it's ahead of the curve, but a, a table, a chart, a graph that shows the general categories of individuals as they flow and that we can start to target because I think we could go to the trust immediately and start to rattle the chains there with the people who are vulnerable because of uh, behavioral health care issues and start to rattle their chains to get in front of that group. And the more we know how discrete the groups are, we can start to hammer away at the funding sources that we'll need. I would just ask, I guess, what strategy you were hoping that we're going to employ because right now behavioral health needs are addressed through emergency crisis. And then if there's no room at the psychiatric institute or people are otherwise stable and there's nowhere to go, I mean, the solution is housing. I absolutely agree. And, and as I spoke with you last night, I may know of a couple of buildings that are ripe and ready for conversion from one form of transitional housing to another. And once we have discrete sets of people, pockets of 30, like I heard a number last night or other numbers uh, that we could start to target specific places across town, because I agree housing is, it just has to be the answer. All right, thanks. Um, okay, so I am next in the queue and then I have Mr. Solt. Um, so uh, I guess much more of an implementation question for me. Um, so the only of these four buckets ideas that you have here that it has a range is the contact driven outreach. Um, how scalable are these things? Is it 100,000 or nothing? No, of course not. We will do the best we can with what we have. Um, we will try to meet needs. This is to be not constantly in a posture of asking the community for donations and having to do that management. That is significant. We learned that last summer. Um, so all of these are scalable and it's just what we can offer. I think one of the costs in here that we've really considered is food. Food is expensive and food will be needed. And food is such a key component to being able to get engagement. Thanks. That's that's helpful. Uh, Mr. Salt. Thank you. So I have comments and questions. So along the lines of I think where Mr. Constant is going, we're going to increase all this outreach. But again, we need somewhere to put people. So the shelter, the housing, it's obviously lacking. I have a hard time, I guess, shutting the Sullivan down, knowing we have nowhere for people to go which I know it's what we're trying to solve. But um, as far as I like navigation centers, I like mobile navigation centers. Have you thought about putting um, some resources or maybe they already are at hospitals and clinics that some of these people may go to as well? 
So we do have partnerships with um, healthcare providers. We have a healthcare healthcare and homelessness integration director. Um, and that is where some of those relationships we would hope to leverage, particularly for highly vulnerable needs, the community health workers and others that we've already established relationships with. And then the solo medics really allows us to hopefully prevent some of those emergency room visits because we're addressing issues as we see them come up. Okay, good. And then um, kind of the, it was touched on like a lot of homeless need to get from point A to point B. So bus passes, anchor rides, APD, AFD, have you also thought about, I know, I think uh, we're looking at possibly some kind of Uber type system as well. Is that if we control that for those that are in need, that could be a form of outreach. At least I got them in the vehicle for a 10 minute ride and I can help, you know, maybe make that outreach then, you know, at least that, Hey, I've, it's not, um, I can help you, but Hey, here's the sources for you to go when you're ready. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So one, we've previously had non-critical transport contracts, which help us get people reliably from point A to point B to meet their needs, particularly for appointments. Um, and as well, we had an all COC meeting this morning, um, which is where we engage the community and the continuum of care. Um, we are working on um, HD has what we call the blue book, which is a book of resources, but also additional resources we can kind of update in real time to get out to folks so that they know where to find information, or I'm sorry, to find resources. The big thing is, is you can give someone all of that information. The question is, are they in a position to engage with it? And that's where the contact-driven outreach is really important, because if I give you that information today and I've never met you before... I don't know that it has much, um, you have much buy-in to what I've given you, but if I've seen you at a pop-up multiple times and you keep telling me that you really need this thing and I'm like, here you go, it's right here, you're much more likely. So it, it's that balance. Thanks. And then two more real quick. Uh, showers, uh, nice to have a laundry trailer as well. Um, yeah, you know how that is. And Yes, we would love if you'd want to fund a laundry trailer. We would make that happen. Um, I have been um, working with Member Cross about um, clothing exchange, though, as we can build up a thing of clothing and do commercial laundry, um, and because he is an expert in that. Um, so we have been um, brainstorming around that. Yeah, and the last last things that I comment, just, uh, you know, outreach is not only for those seeking shelter, but also those that are housed as well, um, that may be one incident away from being unhoused. Yes, thank you for highlighting that. And that's really where the mobile navigation and the work on prevention and diversion is really important. The inflow right now is still considerable and we're finding it's because people have ended rental assistance and can't access rents um, or buildings have changed hands and landlords have increased rents after 30 days. Thank you. Ms. Dern. Thank you. So I have some questions about the housing focused outreach and the mobile navigation services. Um, one of the first questions I had is on, on the two grants that you're going to leverage the funding opportunities. Um, are these uh, the ARPA grants? I, I mean, I assume that this will run out at some point. And uh, so I want to speak to, you know, how much is left. And, and then in terms of the uh, Bezos for families, is this an ongoing opportunity? Is this a multi-year grant? Um, I'll let you answer it. So we're in a two-year funding cycle for both. Both started in November 2022. So we can definitely leverage the opportunity for this summer. All of these proposals are for like May 1 to the end of October. So we're trying to triage in addition to kind of keeping the focus on the medium term, which is an emergency shelter location and the long term of housing. But this is a this is a triage plan. With, I assume, the hope that we'll have some more permanent housing as we go along here. So um, the other question I have is how many navigators do we currently have? I know you want to add four to six, but I'm wondering how many are we operating with now? There is no housing focused navigation or I'm sorry, no housing focused outreach out in the field right now zero. Um, there are some housing navigators at the Sullivan Arena. We've been working alongside them to do coordinated entry, try to get people ready um, for the for the closure of the Sullivan. But um, that, that once the Sullivan closes, those go away. A little bit of a harder question. Is that request based on the amount of money that's available? And so how many would we ideally, I mean, I, I, I know the lot, but, but if you understand what I'm saying, is this going to match the need that we have, or is this just kind of? 
That's a, that is the harder question because we don't know how many units we'll have at any given point. We know that four to six housing navigators allow us to um, definitely move quickly when we do have a number of units. So like if the former Barrett Hotel is coming online and we need to go out and triage and get all those applications in and do all those things where they match on the coordinated entry list, we can handle it because in addition to this, the coalition staff and our partners, we would call all hands on deck and we'd make it happen. But when we don't have an influx, a big influx of housing units, we think four to six can handle the kind of two, threes, fives, tens that come in. And when we don't have them busy doing that, get other people ready so that when they do match with housing, we've already done the pre-work. And one final question, I guess I'll ask, um, not to uh, monopolize time here. Uh, how many partner agencies are you working with? How many organizations around, around the city? And roughly, I know you cannot answer this, but I just think it's important to go on the record. How many volunteers does that represent? Oh, that's a tough question. So the continuum of care is vast. Um, it's everyone that you normally think of. So Catholic Social Services, Beans Cafe, Rural Cap. Um, we now have new types of partnerships like Sala Medics, but it's Nine Star Employment Services. It's Beha Alaska Behavioral Health. I mean, it's anyone who would intersect with someone experiencing homelessness. Um, it's, so it's very vast. Downtown Hope Center, the shelters. Volunteers are usually more agency-based, and then we often get volunteers in specifically when we do volunteer calls, um, often to create hygiene packs or outreach packs. Um, and so I would say that there are literally hundreds of people engaged in volunteering to help people experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. I want to note for the record that Mr. Cross has joined us. Mr. Constant. Thanks. I, I just want to put, put a coda on something that I hear a lot. Um, I hear a lot that a navigation center was proposed at Tudor and Elmore. And um, I just want people to be very clear. There has been no evidence put forward that the proposal for what was intended at the corner of Tudor and Elmore was, in fact, ever going to be successful as what would be known as a navigation center outside of this city. Because if you look at how it was planned and resourced, and if you look at how the Sullivan Arena is operated, we still haven't evolved to the point where we understand what the concept of a navigation center is. And so what is required for a navigation center to function is substantial resources, providers on site, and all of these things that we're talking about aggressively being available. And I have been to places that have functioning navigation centers. So I just want to reiterate that every time I hear the term, the assembly rejected the navigation center at Tudor and Elmore, that's not what happened. There was never a meaningful, meaningful proposal that would have achieved the concept. <laughs> All right, Mr. Cross, I know you went in. I'm going to ask you to please be brief. I need us to keep on focus. Mr. Cross. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I just, you know, feeding off what Mr. Cross said, I guess my recollection is slightly different because I thought that the navigation center that was proposed in Elmer and Tudor was kind of uh, like the, um, uh, uh, not Catholic Social Services Solution, um, the uh, next to Beans Cafe, um, which is a navigation center where you had all the service providers, I guess on a larger scale with included housing, but I'm, I guess my recollection is slightly different, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving, moving us on. Um, so I think that's the end of the discussion. Um, so next step in the process is the go, no go shelve. Um, so we're gonna do the same as last time. I will start, go around the table. I want everyone to participate, go to the phone. Um, so for my part, um, I think this is one of the more realistic and quickly actionable uh, sections that, that were included in the resolution. So I would say go um, with, the with I guess, sort of my um, prescriptions or qualifiers on that is go with some mix of all four uh, of the ideas proposed here hard for me to give a total number at this time until we really delve into all of the ideas and we don't have unlimited funding. So obviously we're gonna have to prioritize which of these ideas that we decide to fund. So um, that is my recommendation is go, some mix of all of them, hard to talk about the exact dollar amount at this time. 
we'll go ahead and um, go on around the table. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is realistic, and it's it's just a compendium. So, um, but it's needed, and I think it it takes away barriers from what it's going to take for us to get people into housing. And so, um, I think that's important. I mean, if we don't recognize that, especially in this area of sorry, housing focused outreach, if we don't realize that that's a component that's needed, and and if we don't fund it, we're not going to come up with an answer. So, thanks. So, is that a go? It's a go. Although okay. I would say. Um, you know, with all due respect, I actually look at these things as four separate things and not, you know, as a package. And so, so do you have a specific ones that you would want to focus and not others? Uh, well, I would like to focus on them all so, so that when we're looking at money that it, we don't look at this as being one. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that we 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 give each part um, uh, the benefit of being able to get the funding separately. Does that make sense? That does make sense. So okay. would it be fair to, and apologize for being pushy, but I want to make sure I characterize what you're saying accurately. Okay. Uh, is it fair to say that you would support some mix of all options? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. thanks. Go ahead, Mr. Peterson. Well, you know, I, I've been saying all along that <clears throat> we, the Navigation Center, uh, was sort of getting the uh, uh, cart ahead of the horse because we we didn't build the rehab facility that we needed so that we could uh, send the people uh, to that center. That would be one of the places that uh, the, the the people would be na navigated to, and and it's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, this seems like uh, more of a real realistic uh, idea to move forward with. And so I, I, I think this would be a go. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and just to qualify, go some mix of all options. OK, thanks. Mr. Salt. So I'm, I'm depending on funding sources on a go. This is some of the banter that I've been talking about, the outreach. But just real briefly to summarize, so we have a bunch of people sheltered at Sullivan. We're going to dump them on the street. We're going to give them outreach services and help to put them in places we don't have. So it's a leg of the stool. We're missing some legs. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Cross. Well, I've made my position known uh, fairly well that I really think that we should just follow through with the Tudor Nav Center. Um, I see that as a another branch of like what's happening next to Beans, as I just mentioned, where because I think what happens is you need to have that when people come in, there is a multitude of resources available to direct them and then a system that follows up. I think we kind of and, and, and maybe that's just my impression. I could be wrong, but I feel as if our follow up is 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 poor. And that individuals then end up in the same and there's recidivism. But I'm I mean, so sorry, Mr. Cross, to yeah, interrupt just, you, but I actually need a motion to extend. Can I get one to extend to 1230? Motion to extend to 1230. Second down. Okay. Is there any opposition? Seeing none, we're extended. Go ahead, Mr. Cross. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm my preference is anything that moves towards getting the Tudor Nav Center done. And I really like uh, the outreach, which is going to people because they're, they're not necessarily going to come to us. We need to go to where they're at. We need to bring those services and let them know that they're valuable and they're worth fighting for and they have worth and embrace them and bring them in because it's a little real easy just to bury your head in the snow and just uh, focus on uh, your dismal situation and not realize that resources are there and then self-medicate. So yes, with public outreach, yes, with going to where they are and yes, on the Tudor Nav Center. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go mix of options. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ms. LaFrance. Uh, Mr. Volan. Go. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so then um, what I hear is a consensus of go, some mix of all the options. I respect some of the other qualifiers that folks have added on to it. Uh, I, I 
will request that not be part of the motion itself. Oh yeah, sorry, Mr. Constant. So I am a go and I would like somebody within the departments to make a summary of all the funding that we've provided for outreach and the outcomes that have been achieved or outcomes, the outputs, because I know we have funded outreach over the last two years. And so um, I would like to have a snapshot of what we did and what worked. Okay. Thank you. All right. So then um, I will ask someone to make a motion based off of what I'm hearing, which is go some mix of all options. There's a request for information for a summary of the funding for outreach and the outcomes slash outputs. Um, so can I get a motion to that effect? From someone on the committee, please. I will move your motion. Is there a second? second. Thank you. Um, uh, is there any opposition from committee members on that motion? To summarize, that is a, a go, some mix of all of the various options, and there was a request for information for a summary of, fi of funding for outreach and the outcomes and outputs. And any opposition to that? Okay, not hearing any, then that motion, that recommendation is approved. Um, so one of the things, now that we do have a go, we can go through some of the other options uh, or other uh, discussion points. So timeline, um, I guess to the coalition, um, how quickly could you actually implement this? Like if we funded it on the 18th or the 25th, would you be able to implement it fairly quickly? So I'm just going to run through the four options. We can obviously scale contact-driven outreach fairly quickly. Um, we can also start planning and getting things in um, order for highly vulnerable individuals. Um, with regard to the housing navigators, we could probably um, start that process and probably be online within the first two weeks of May. Maybe not a full steam, but at least partially. Um, and we could, if we knew we were having um, funding for how many ever, we could based on the funding, um, the mobile navigation services, we would be able to go ahead and set that calendar and, and those locations so we could get those pushed out and start working with partners. Um, as soon as we knew the funding existed, it'd probably be a two to three week planning period. Okay, um, then I guess question to the administration because y'all would be the ones that we're working with. Um, how quickly do you think we could realistically get an appropriation, understanding we have to figure out the dollar amount and the, and the source Putting that aside, how quickly could we get something before us? Through the chair to Mr. Rivera, I actually am sending an email right now to our grants and contracts team, as well as uh, acting director Kim Rash to kind of lay the groundwork. I think um, I don't want to assign a timeline for my team, but I would like to say probably to get it on to the agenda for the 25th. Okay. Are we good with the 25th as the timeline to get an appropriation before us? Not hearing any objection, then April 25th it is. Um, in terms of the leads for this one, um, from the administration, who will be the lead? Ms. Johnson. Through the chair. I can take lead. Okay. And then from the assembly, is there anyone that's really interested in taking lead? Otherwise, I'm fine. Okay, I will take the lead on this one. All right, I think that's it for that one. Mr. Chair, may I ask sure. a question? Um, once the amounts are determined and in kind of which buckets, um, we would want to have the opportunity prior to the item coming before you to refine what we can do to set the expectations because what we've provided you is kind of a men menu and range and we want to make sure whatever is approved is clear to the both, both to you all as to our capacity and to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constant? Yeah, I think actually I don't see anyone here from the eighth floor, but what concerns me about the timeline is that we've had real challenges moving anything through the procurement process. And um, so assuming we take action on the 25th, it could be four months before we see a concluded process to achieve an actual fungible plan and um, I don't know how we're going to overcome that hurdle. 
um, if the status quo is going to be the way we proceed. And so um, that is a concern for me. And the reason I bring that up is because I think probably there should be some process to allow, I don't want to call it necessarily negotiation, but a process by which the specific terms, the deliverables are um, gone back and forth between the potential operator and those who are putting forward the proposal, not one that's between the purchasing department who wants to set some kind of requirements. And so it should be based on what the leadership group of that committee, which would be who was just made on that list, sit and negotiate specific terms for what the effective deliverables are. So not just the ideal and not just what purchasing is willing to, but what the group agrees on. So anyhow, I just think that that's an important aspect to put in the conversation. Thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully, um, I know for me, I feel the sense of urgency and, and I think, don't want to speak for the UMI administration, but I hope that they also feel the sense of urgency. And so hopefully we can not move in the, the normal pattern that we have seen, but hopefully in a more expedited and collaborative pattern. Um, okay, so next one is section two, non-congregate. I think the um, discussion on this one is fairly simple. We have an RFI that's gonna be out by the end of the week. Can you speak to that, Ms. Johnson? Yeah, through the chair to Mr. Rivera, I'll be brief. Um, we put together an RFI. I shouldn't say we. Um, grants and contracts with the Anchorage Health Department put together an RFI. Um, I had sent it to you for your um, opinion on it. You approved it. Uh, Acting Director Kim Rash approved it. I approved it. And so now it is going into shopping cart uh, with procurement, and it will be uh, put out for 10 days. And that should be out either by the end of this week, which I'm pushing for, or early next week. Thanks. Eh. And just in case anyone um, uh, interprets that word approval, I do not have any approval authority over RFIs, just FYI. Um, okay, so then um, we do have one option that has been put on the table so far, uh, which is the aviator. Can you speak to that? Yes, through the chair uh, to Mr. Rivera, we have ongoing conversations uh, with the operators at the Aviator Hotel. They have offered uh, 25 long-term leases for people um, that they deem that they don't feel comfortable putting out onto the street at the end of this contract. And I think as a community, uh, we recognize that there are people that um, from a morality standpoint, we wouldn't feel comfortable placing uh in them into unsheltered territory. And so um, we have ongoing conversations with them uh, about the use of possible ERA2 funds for the long-term leases if they do qualify. Um, but there is going to most likely be a request uh, of the assembly for an appropriation um, for staffing uh, that is not covered by ERA2 funds. Um, so that's an ongoing conversation that we continue to have with them. Thanks. Um, do we have a... Um... Do we have a dollar amount that we're talking about for that staffing? Through the chair, we have not received um, a request from the aviator for them. Uh, we did tell them that if uh, the tenants did qualify for ERA2, that would cover their rental, but they are asking for additional staffing. And so I have not seen a number value from that. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or discussion from the body here? Okay, not seeing any. Um, I, I don't feel the need it, for this particular item to do a, a go, no go on it. Um, is there any other opinion on that? I think we'll get things as they move forward. Okay, got it. So then we won't go through the exercise for a go, no go. We'll just see items as the administration brings them forward to us. Um, okay, so next one on the list is section three and seven, so alternative forms of shelter and sanction camps task force. Um, so let's go ahead and start with section three, which is the alternative forms of shelter. Um, 
Can you speak to that, Ms. Johnson? Yes, through the chair. Um, I spoke briefly on this last night at the assembly meeting. We have ongoing conversations with the building department to see what Title 21 and Title 23 uh, changes would need to be made to allow for um, alternative housing or pallet shelters uh, to be erected in the city. Um, one thing that I didn't really expound upon yesterday, but kind of mentioned briefly is that Kansas determined a single property. Um, the community kind of came together and said, let's get rid of all Title 21, Title 23 um, building codes aside from safety, health and safety that would be required and try something. Um, that's not something I'm proposing, but it is an idea I just want to put on uh, out into the open. And so we're going to meet with them for the long term. But if it's uh, the will of the city, we could, you know, definitely get pallet shelters shipped up here uh, before summer if if we wanted to go that route. So uh, that's all I have for you today. Thanks. Any discussion from the body? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Salt. Yeah, I, I as I spoke last night, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I like pallet shelters. It's an option. We should try it. Uh, I think we said roughly 30 two person shelters were potentially available at I think the website's at a cost of 7,500 per I don't know what shipping would be so make it 10,000 per copy so 300,000 we could get 30 of them and um, I'll say it, it's not gonna let regulation stand in the way of us putting them up so I think we can find a solution thanks Miss Stern thank you Mr. Chair um, I'm just wondering have I, I know there are quite a few of these sort of um, units these 30 cluster units in in the pacific northwest and notably in like the portland area have have has anyone from the administration gone on a visit uh is there anything i can look at and and just reference i'm gonna let uh kathleen speak because she has uh seen them but i am headed to kansas in june to go see them so through the chair this is kathleen mclaughlin with restorative and reentry services um i did tour the everett uh, manufacturer pl uh, plight, uh, plant and um, have seen some of the stand-ups. The, one of the most effective that uh, my partner at Restorative, Monica Gross, saw was at uh, Santa Barbara. You should look it up. It's called Dignity Village. It was so successful that as a result of that, they are expanding it now. Uh, so the concept is these are movable, which is the beauty of them because if they don't work at one site, you can put them someplace else. The second piece is, is that they are, um, they allow people to be who they are in the community. And what I mean by that is many of the people that we serve in this area, um, they like to be community beings and they fail at apartments because they bring all their friends and family, especially if they're Alaska native. We need to embrace the culture, uh, the differences in culture in our community. I know I just went way off into a rabbit hole, but my point being, they can be solid, they can be used, they can be insulated, and they can be moved. So that there's a lot of flexibility about them. Thanks. Um, so I guess I just wanna ask a preemptive question before um, we go to the next part of this. So I think there are a few different ideas that were in the resolution. There was pallet shelters and that's in, I think the way I interpret that is the, the literal company pallet shelters, right? There was modular buildings and we didn't really specify what exactly that might mean. And then there was the ASD, the Anchorage School District relocatables. Um, so uh, what I would want to do is really bifurcate those ideas rather than treat them all as one and see if there's any interest in sort of go, no go, shelf, et cetera, on those various options. Because uh, I know, Mr. Salt, you'd had the specific on one of the options, 300,000 yesterday, right? So um, are we okay moving forward with this particular section in that manner? Okay, then we'll start with pallet shelters. Again, frame of reference, that is the specific company, pallet shelters. Um, I actually don't want to start with the go, no go discussion on this one. So, cause I want to think, sorry. Um, so Mr. Constant, do you feel comfortable starting that one? 
yeah, I have no problem exploring the use of these properties or pieces of equipment as uh, an element of our solution. Um, a little bit of note to what Ms. McLaughlin said, they're portable and can move if they don't work in a place. And there are some communities that set them on a slow rotating schedule, six months here, six months there, so that no one place becomes the permanent place. And so I just continue to raise the concern of ghettoization of neighborhoods. And um, every neighborhood should have an opportunity to be the fortunate host of the place where we resolve homelessness. Thanks. So I guess, is it fair to characterize that you're sort of in the middle, not necessarily go, no, go, but somewhere in the middle? I'm okay with the experiment. Let's, let's see. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, Mr. Voland. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go. Go ahead. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, <clears throat> I'm just wondering where we would put them that would possibly be a big question that we would have to uh, decide. And I'm also wondering <clears throat> if it would be less expensive to build these here uh, with some apprentice carpenters or something. Uh, maybe kill two birds with one stone, develop some carpentry expertise as needed in our community and, and, and have some tiny homes for people. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead. Go. Go. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this seems like any like a viable option that's worth exploring. I think that um, clearly there will need to be uh, a deliberate public process for this. I can see where you know some folks might you know, as we would expect, be concerned about pallet shelters and whatever accompanying uh, facilities, whether it's through trailers or what, um, would be included. But again, any viable option, and this seems like one, is worth pursuing. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so then I, I will go ahead and uh, also put myself down as a go. Um, but I think for me, and the reason why in my mind, maybe other people will disagree, but the reason in my mind why I tied sections three and seven together is that um, section seven deals with the sanctioned camps and getting to the question that Mr. Peterson asked is where, where are we gonna put them? Sanctioned camps and that task force really talks about that, right? Goes through the process to determine costs, where we might put these things um, because I mean, de, de facto, if we put pallet shelter somewhere, likely going to be on public land, what is that going to be? It's a sanctioned camp, right? I mean, I don't know any other way to really talk about them. Is I guess I'll turn to the expert. Is that pretty accurate to say? Through the chair, they are, there's so many opportunities, uh, and I don't think you can say that it's just that. They can be communities as well. Thanks. No, I appreciate that that expansive definition. Um, okay, but yes, for me, I think we need to go, but we need to go through the appropriate process um, to figure out all of the details. Um, so, uh, which one of the committee members wants to make a motion to um, encapsulate all of that discussion? Okay, so let's try this. Um, let's make a motion to explore the implementation of pallet shelters approximately 30 within the municipality at potentially multiple sites for use this summer. I'll second that. Thanks, so I heard that, that second. Um, All right, then is there any opposition to that uh, motion? All right, then let me go ahead and go through the process here. Um, 
Sorry, what section is this one? Section seven? Someone, ah, you all don't have it in front of you. Uh, three, okay, this one's three. Um, okay, so it was a go, uh, explore possibility of 30 for use this summer. I will say that for use this summer really does drive the, the timeline for the task force, <laughs> but um, we'll do our best. Um, so I guess the motion I think talks about the timeline. I don't have the agenda in front of me in terms of assembly meetings, but um, can you uh, describe for use this summer what, what you might be talking about? Not that we have an extraordinary long summer. Let's shoot for May 23rd. July. <laughs> so I, I heard July 1. I think I'm really? So, so, so an, an assembly meeting after July 1. Is that fair? OK. Oh, Lord. Just for, uh, for context, July 1 is the beginning of the state fiscal year. If we're going to pull the trigger on this, we should aggressively turn to Juno before the budget is done and say, we are doing something and we need your help. I understand that, but this will make it more specific and concrete. But the July 1 is significant in Alaska. All right. Um, so who from the administration is going to take point? Through the chair, I'll take point. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I, your call. All right. Um, assembly. Um, I'll take it. Okay. All right. Um, and then do we have any specific requests for information as we move forward with this process? I know some folks had. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to make sure I know that Sterling Supply down in Sterling offers similar types of, of units. And so I just want to make sure that somehow we 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 look at that. I'm sorry, say that one more time. Sterling Supply down in Sterling. They do these same types of units. They may not do them to the design and they may not have, you know, they don't design them for the purpose, but we might be able to get them cheaper or quicker. So I'm just putting that out there. Um, so I think the information we need is what it takes, um, Title 21, 23, and um, what would it take to actually create sort of a dignity village model, not just a free-for-all centennial campground model. Thank you. All right. Um, so I am just going to do a slash section seven. So um, before we move on to any of the other parts in section three, um, I'll go ahead and I want to move us to, actually, what time is it? If I might, before we move on, under your request for information, the Dignity Village model. Yeah. Um, I think that, that it's implied in there, but we need to make sure it's explicit. What's the management structure? Which means staffing, control, liability, who's the boss? Thank you. Um, okay, so I provided everyone a draft of the sanctioned camps resolution. <laughs> I think as you will see in that sanctioned uh, camps task force resolution, um, I had a goal of getting that report, including some of the things that we talked about here, um, getting that report in August. Ha, so we're gonna have to get that much sooner than that if we're actually gonna be able to do this work. Um, but 
my goal was to get this before us on this resolution before us on April 25th, just considering priority. I was going to prioritize the behavioral health task force, which some folks have already talked about as a huge need, um, and then do this one after. But if there's an opportunity to try to do both at the same time and me not sleep at all, I guess I can do that. Um, okay, anything else on this one before we move on? Yeah, go ahead. So I understand what we're looking at is the context of the this outdoor kind of camp model. But I want to reiterate that for every dollar we spend on permanent vulnerability, we should be ensuring that we have an investment going on for housing support and stability. And so I'm not sure how we bake that into this conversation, but I'm not going to let any conversation about camps happen without us talking about housing and what's the path. And so I'm not sure where that fits in here, but we need to make sure that there is a path to housing built into this in every step. Thank you. Um, yes, housing is the solution. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think considering our, our limitation on time, I'm going to go ahead and just stop us there. Um, so what we didn't get to today was the other parts of Section 3, so the modular buildings, which I know, Kevin, that's a big thing for you, Mr. Cross. Uh, we didn't get to the ASD relocatables to see if that's something that we want to actually move forward with. Um, and then we didn't get to the behavioral health task force discussion. Um, I did put on the agenda um, for next week's regular meeting for us to wrap up this discussion if we didn't finish it today. So we'll go ahead and plan for those parts of the discussion for next Wednesday. Um, with that, can I get a show of hands of folks uh, in the audience who would like to speak? One, okay, great. Uh, two. Okay. So then can I get a motion to extend uh, by five minutes to 1235? Motion extend 1235. Okay. Any opposition? Okay. We're extended to 1235. Um, whoever would like to go first, uh, if you can come up to a mic, uh, welcome. You'll have three minutes. I'll put on a timer. Thank you for having me. My name is uh, Joe Wood. I live directly across the street from the Sullivan and I'm tired. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, just shame on you guys for blocking the uh, gold line from being open. Uh, Anchorage has a unique opportunity to be a, a model for the country. We can turn that into a training center. You know, and you come into that, Mr. Cross, with your construction background. Um, you know, we, we could turn turn the homeless people into model citizens by, you know, from, from the boiler room up to the roof. You know, uh, I'm willing to volunteer my time to uh, teach them in the kitchen. Uh, my chef at Orso has left that fully operational with dishes, pans, the equipment, um, so we could train them. My wife will train them to... Uh, be a waiter, waitress. She does so already at Brew House. Um, so we're in a unique um, opportunity, but you're all blocking each other, and it's sad. We need common ground, common resolutions, and we're tired. Stop bickering amongst each other. It's not about party lines. It's about this city and the homeless. You know, um, right now, because I live across the street since 2009, I've been parking my RV there uh, because my wife is on the Sullivan payroll. I've been forced by APD. I've been in discussion with Miss McLaughlin, and I can't keep an eye on my RV because I've been forced to park it two blocks away in D lot on uh, A Street and 16th. And those vehicles get broken into and stripped. So this is what you put my RV into, that predicament. You know, and I'm tired. Let's let's turn all these negatives into positives. You know, I'd, I'd like to work with you guys on turning that golden line into a, a training center, you know, and give, give them a sense of hope, belief in themselves. Um, and we could be a... a 
a national model on how to handle homelessness. But that's only going to happen if you stop fighting amongst each other and make shit happen. Sorry for the language. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, uh, James Thornton, uh, Fairview Community Council. Um, thank you all for your service, and we're really excited to, you know, see things get better in Fairview. Thank you, Joe. You said it all. I mean, you live across the street. I appreciate you being here. It takes a lot of courage. Um, a lot of people are in tough times right now, obviously, and especially those living under the poverty line and in low-income neighborhods such as Fairview, regardless of a four to 500 person influx in their neighborhood, potentially on the streets with the largest non-motorized population in Anchorage that's shouldering the entire burden for the whole city. Do we not deserve one APD officer to make sure our grocery store stays open for those who would have to move and where would they move? Everyone I ask, what would you do if, if our car's grocery store closed? Okay, I'm gonna stop, I think you get it. Um, thank you, ACEH, it's awesome, but the resources are thin. We're not talking about those that don't want help. We're not talking about that. We're offering to help, we're here, let's do this. Everything he said, right on point. We need a working group to address the impacts on our neighborhood. We're giving all this humanitarian aid to folks. Our neighborhood needs humanitarian aid now. 50 minutes for folks unconscious bleeding out into the streets because it's deprioritized because I'm sure more important things are happening. But people we know are sitting with folks while they may be dying, okay? Um, community see Fairview uh, over the years, not just, not just since the pandemic, but historically. And they say, they see the lack of support while we shoulder the burden. And they say, hell no, excuse my language, not in my neighborhood. And I don't blame them. It's unconscionable for Anchorage to continue to deprioritize our rights and needs with the continued destruction of our daily lives, minds, and hearts while taking care of all the problems of Anchorage the unanswered questions and watching the bureaucracy when this is not a political problem for us. This is a way of life and it's time for change. We are not discussing the criminals and predatory behavior and how we hold folks accountable or don't. It's a justice system issue. Let's fix it. Fairview are the stewards of these, of these services and we care about the folks. We don't just want to see it go out of our neighborhood. We want to see it be handled properly and folks to be given a chance. And the ones that don't respect our community need to be treated differently and triaged differently. Fairness for Fairview. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just double check. <clears throat> All right, uh, I guess since we do have a couple minutes, anyone else like to participate? All right, not seeing anyone. Um, any final committee discussion? All right, not seeing anyone. Then uh, thanks everyone for the progress today. We'll keep doing this next Wednesday. Hello. With that, we are adjourned.